morning, everyone. It's very nice to see you today. Would like to uh, welcome everyone for our second international conference. We are very delighted for everyone to be able to come today, from even from those from Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and even from India. We would like also to acknowledge the presence of our speakers, Dr. Andrew Sol, uh, Professor Andrew Sol, Dr. Thomas Levy, Dr. Sanjay Kapoor, Dr. Elisma Lambert, and Dr. Paul Lee. Thank you for coming today. For the next two days, uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to uh, learn from the experts on how we can improve our practice in this age we're in, um, as you well know, um, the stem cells are the one of the brightest, uh, or how would you say, more uh, 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 things that uh, are very much in use by our doctors today. So this is the one reason why we also uh, included mitochondria because uh, one of the things that are important also for stem cells to propagate would be the presence or the activation or proper functioning of the mitochondria. Therefore, our uh, theme for this uh, second conference is really on stem cells and mitochondria and how it can improve our health and as well as increase and improve our lifespan and longevity. So we are so delighted for everyone to come today. We hope that you would be able to learn something. And uh, please, if you have any questions towards the end of each uh, uh, talk, we will have some minutes for everyone to ask questions. We want to be as uh, intimate as possible, we are not going to be too hurried. So please uh, take your seat, relax, enjoy the next two days. We hope you'll be able to learn something. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our first speaker is uh, Doc Professor Andrew Sol. Professor Andrew Sol is the editor-in-chief of the Orto Molecular News Network. He's also the an, uh, Hall of Fame inductee into the uh, Orto Molecular Society. So he's also has been a teacher, a professor. He's an expert in the field of Orto Molecular Medicine. He's the main proponent or main author of Doctor Yourself books, series of books, Doctor Yourself. He's also the one of the main speaker for um, the Mega Vitamin Man and that vitamin movie. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome Dr. Uh, Professor Andrew Sol for his first lecture on Vitamins Against Aging. We're going to talk about the historical perspective of vitamins, vitamin supplementation against aging. It's a very serious thought that perhaps human beings are the only animals that know they're going to die. It was Professor Emanuel Cheraskin at the University of Alabama Medical School who said some years ago, Man is a food-dependent creature. If you don't feed him, he will die. If you feed him improperly, part of him will die. Our bunk, Mr. Fuller, credited with the invention of the geodesic dome, of all things, commented that by the time we are 88 years of age, we will have consumed 300 tons of food and air and water. Certainly in the United States, some of the food that they're consuming is not very good. 
But this is not a new problem. In a statement attributed to ancient Egypt, one quarter of what you eat keeps you alive. The other three quarters keeps your doctor alive. <laughs> we know, almost everyone knows, that unprocessed whole natural foods are far better sources of vitamins and minerals than our highly processed factory foods. When McDonald's Corporation was sued, they actually put a statement just like this in their defense, saying that people know what we serve is not nutritionally that good. If McDonald's knows it, everyone knows it. But you know, before the advent of dietary supplements, there were no other sources of nutrients at all. It was either your food or nothing. Many years ago, there were health spas or sanatoriums in the United States and certainly other parts of the world where people went to take the cure, as it was called. They went to rest and rejuvenate and hopefully improve their health with the ultimate goal of living longer. Now these diets at the health spas were health nut diets, the kind of thing that people would say, oh, you're a health nut. Well, Jack LaLanne, an exercise fitness personality in the United States, used to say, when people said, are you a health nut? And he said, I'm a filbert, meaning a hazelnut. He, he said, I'm a hazelnut. And I say to people, if you're not a health nut, well, what kind of a nut are you? Health nut diets actually make medical sense. For instance, they're quite high in vitamin C because of their emphasis on fresh raw food, salads, fruits, raw milk, clean raw milk, and sprouted grains. Most people are unaware that raw milk and sprouted grains are actually fairly good sources of vitamin C, and wheatgrass is a superb source of vitamin C. Sanatorium diets were relatively high in vitamin E because they contained nuts, seeds, whole grains, not white bread, not white pasta, but whole grains, and wheat germ. Not only that, these foods contain quite a lot of magnesium. And sanatorium diets were very high in carotenes and fiber from fruits, vegetables, and vegetable juices. A strict adherence to this fresh, raw, or unprocessed sanatorium diet, even though it sounds a little extreme, will actually prove to be an effective regimen. And for decades, even centuries, people found that their health was better when they ate better. Here's a gentleman you may have never heard of, James Caleb Jackson. He was a doctor of medicine. He was an abolitionist, meaning he was one of the very first Americans to take a strong stand against slavery. Indeed, James Caleb Jackson was a friend of Frederick Douglass, a leaving black uh, abolitionist in the United States, famous for his advocacy to end slavery. Jackson was also the founder of what was, for a long time, the world's largest nature cure hospital. And this was in Dansville, New York. Now, when I visit other countries and people say, where are you from? I say, New York. And most people, guess what? They assume I'm from Manhattan, from New York City, from the Bronx, from Brooklyn. But the fact is, New York State is a big state. It's over 300 miles wide, and I'm up in the other end of it, up towards Toronto. Right across the lake is Toronto. We get their winters, and we don't like it, but this is where I'm from. Not far from me, only about an hour's easy drive, is Dansville, New York. It was a small town when Jackson was there, and it's still pretty tiny. So in Dansville, New York, the middle of almost nowhere, there was the largest nature cure hospital. And there's a photo of it in its heyday around the turn of the century. Uh, that's the turn of the 20th century. 
The building still stands. I have been through it. It's gone to rack and ruin. But in its time, this was state of the art for people that wanted to get well and stay well. For instance, on the roof, they had little seats that people could sit in to take sunshine. And an attendant would turn your seat for you as the sun moved across the sky. There was a mineral spring where people got their water. And on the roof of, the, of this institution, there was a dance floor. And at night, they had dances outside on the roof. And if you were there when I was there back in 1979, you could still see the marks on the floor for where the basketball court was. Now, you might think, exercise and eating right, does this really have medical power? I think we're coming to realize that the only true medicine is taking care of your body before it breaks. And for people that went to our home on the hillside, as it was called, this was a very, very strong way of getting health. It had 122 beds. I had been through the hallways and actually seen the rooms which had very high ceilings, and the doors had louvers, and there were very large windows. Why? Fresh air and sunshine. What a concept. Good food, exercise, fresh air, sunshine. And they also practiced hydrotherapy. So people would have various types of baths. They did outdoor exercise. They had organic food. And naturally, they did not have the kind of food which around the turn of the century was consumed by so many people in quantity, excessive amounts of meat and alcohol. These were not on the menu. After uh, James Caleb Jackson died, the organization passed into the hands of a very colorful character, Bernard Adolphus McFadden. If you were to describe an American health nut, he's the one you'd start with. He was born in 1868. He was orphaned at the age of 11. He was a millionaire by the age of 35. And back then, a million dollars was actually a lot of money. McFadden was a publisher, and he published many successful presentations and, and magazines, among them True Detective, his health magazine, Physical Culture, and uh, True Story. And True Story magazine is actually published to this day. He was a personal friend of George Bernard Shaw, and McFadden was something of a movie star, not that he was in movies, but he had that kind of star power. He knew everybody. Every year, McFadden led a walk from New York City to Dansville. And this is a 325-mile walk. And all they did was eat natural foods, uh, whole grains. And when people saw them going by eating their whole grains out of little bags, it got known as the Cracked Wheat Derby. This was the nickname for this health walk. McFadden personally led the health walk. McFadden had been a wrestler. He could tear a phone booth in half, and then he could put it on top of itself and tear it again. He could tear a pack of playing cards in half. That's harder than it sounds. I've tried it. I can't. There is Bernard McFadden with a very young, famous child movie star, Shirley Temple. Now, McFadden, not being a physician, but being very interested in health, was something of a public relations expert. He decided to try parachute jumping in his 80s. He landed without injury. Some people think it's because he was tough, having done nothing but sleeping on bare floors for decades. As I said earlier, the unvarnished truth, this man was a health extremist. He was 87 when he died in 1955. You can see from this cover of a physical culture magazine dating approximately 1920 that McFadden got in trouble with the post office. He had these covers, which at the time were considered to be obscene. Even now, it's a little bit over the edge. But imagine this 100 years ago. 
So he was cautioned by the government to knock it off. He didn't, of course. He kept sending out his magazine for a long time. It became famous. I would like to shift our discussion with this historical start to some of the age-related illnesses that we now face, perhaps in part because we don't listen as much as we should to McFadden and to uh, Dr. Jackson. Let's look at macular degeneration. Age-related macular degeneration is the most frequent cause of blindness in the Western world. Now, there is evidence, and of course there is controversy, as to just what extent vitamins can help this condition. There was a pretty good study done back in 1994 and published in the Journal of the American Medical Association by the Eye Disease Case Control Study Group, and they found that a higher dietary intake of carotene was associated with a lower risk for a macular degeneration. Now, likelihood of macular degeneration is reduced a significant amount, about half. Imagine a 50% reduction in risk. If that were a drug that got that, it would probably be on television. But because it's a vitamin, it slipped through. That's why I like to bring this forward. So people who took larger amounts of carotenes were less likely to have macular degeneration. Carotenes are found in orange vegetables. Carrot, carotene. So they're found in sweet potatoes, yams, squash. But they're also abundant in green vegetables. Now what's confusing about this is that you look at green leafy vegetables and you don't see any orange. But if you live in a part of the world, like Rochester, New York, where I'm from, where you have the change of seasons, at the time that it gets colder, the leaves turn color, don't they? It's called autumn or fall. Now they go from green to orange, green to red, green to yellow. That's because the green chlorophyll dies off when it gets cold. And now you see what the color of the leaf really was all along. But you couldn't see it because of all that chlorophyll. So when the chlorophyll dies, you can see the colors. You can see the flavonoids. You can see the, um, uh, what we're talking about, the carotenoids carotene-like substances. So green or orange vegetables are very high in carotene. We also know from an interesting study published in the Archives of Ophthalmology that macular degeneration occurs twice as often in patients with low levels of vitamin E. Most of us hear about vitamin D as in Doug all the time, very popular now, which is good. And since Linus Pauling, most of us have heard about vitamin C, also very popular. But you don't hear a lot anymore about vitamin E, but you did back in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. Interest in vitamin E, I hope, will come back. After all, if more vitamin E is an eddy, means less macular degeneration, all eye doctors should be interested. Now here's how good it works. Uh, here is a study, again, Archives of Ophthalmology, this is from 2001, of a good-sized trial, 3,640 participants, and it showed that vitamin E and vitamin C and beta-carotene and also zinc reduce the risk of progression to advanced age-related macular degeneration by 25% after six years, and here's the kicker, in those already showing evidence of the disease. This is important. This is not general prevention. This is not correlation. This is not speculation. This is actually taking people that have the condition and slowing down the progression. Very, very important. Here's how much they gave. If you are knowledgeable about vitamin supplementation against disease, you will immediately, and I mean immediately, see what's wrong with this protocol. How many people look at this and think, golly, that's not a whole lot of vitamin C now, is it? <laughs> and we take a look at 500 milligrams. 
That is a tiny amount of supplemental vitamin C. Admittedly, the US RDA is about 100 milligrams. This is five times the RDA. And on the face of it, you'd think that's a lot. But it isn't when you have Linus Pauling, who was recommending 10,000 or 20,000 milligrams or more, and other orthomolecular physicians who would recommend up to 200,000 milligrams of C a day. And this is orally. I personally have taken 130,000 milligrams of vitamin C orally when I had influenza. And this amount can be tolerated. For those who are thinking already, how do you know if you're taking too much, the indicator is bowel tolerance. If you take too much vitamin C, you get to bowel tolerance. And bowel tolerance means exactly what you think it means. So when you have loose stool or a rumble in the stomach, or flatulence, you know you're pretty close. And the funny thing is, the sicker you are, the more C you have to take before you get to bowel tolerance. Many of us are aware of intravenous vitamin C, very good therapy. But for people that cannot afford, or simply cannot be tied down for two hours, or get to a doctor who will do it, or live in a country where they allow it, uh, oral vitamin C is cheaper. And it can be done, but you have to use a lot, and you have to divide the dose. I'm throwing this in here because that question almost always comes up, and I expect that you'll have it, and I wanted to offer that right away. So 500 milligrams is a ridiculously small amount of C. Vitamin E, they gave 400 international units. That's a moderately good dose, but they used the synthetic form. Natural vitamin E as an Edward is the right-handed form, the dextro form. They use the synthetic form, which is a mixture of the dextro and the levo forms. Doesn't work as well. And they use synthetic vitamin E, which does not contain all the tocopherols, of which there are four, and all the tocotrinols, of which there are four. So there are actually eight factors in vitamin E, and they gave one of them. Beta carotene, 15 milligrams. Golly, that's a lot, isn't it? No. That's less than one large carrot. Zinc is zinc oxide. Amazing. That's the what you put on your nose so you don't get sunburn. The worst possible choice for an oral supplement of zinc would be zinc oxide. You should use chelated zinc, zinc gluconate, or zinc citrate. This is widely known. Why didn't they do it? And finally, a small amount of copper, which I believe was a minor factor. Even given these low and inappropriate dosages and forms, they had a 25% reduction in progression among people that had the disease. Even with these tiny amounts, now we're thinking, what if we gave more? Of course. So there was a follow-up study, and they eliminated carotene from the protocol and lowered the zinc amount. I think they should have gone the other way. I think they should have increased the numbers. Instead, they took out carotene. Perhaps you've heard of the rationale for why they eliminated carotene. There was a very poor study done in Finland about 20 years ago where they gave a small amount of carotene to heavy smokers. This has been talked about widely over the years. And what they found was when heavy smokers, or people who had been heavy smokers, took a small amount of beta carotene, there was a slight increase in incidence of lung cancer. But I am here to tell you that the amount they gave was very small, and I don't believe beta carotene is harmful to smokers. I think smoking is harmful to smokers. And not only that, in the study that got the beta carotene, they didn't put this in the study results. The group that got the beta carotene had been smoking one year longer than the other group. The media didn't pick that up. No wonder the public is confused. You can live in Malaysia, you can live in Singapore, you can live in Hong Kong, you can live in Japan, in Philippines, in Poland, in England, and even the United States. <laughs> oh my. And you, people are so confused because they believe what they see on television. And they believe what they hear their doctors say. And doctors tend to not have a lot of education in nutrition. 
Some do, most do not. I taught at a chiropractic college, and we required two full nutrition courses of our students, two. And I even said to them, this does not necessarily mean you're going to be the world's expert in nutrition if you have only two courses. But the average American medical school might have one, maybe. So a chiropractor is getting twice as much nutrition education as a medical doctor. And I would say even the chiropractors could use more of it. So you can see my point. Higher doses and more appropriate forms would probably work better. But there is institutional resistance to giving high doses of vitamins. When a person wants to do a study, they have to get approval from many authorities. You know what I'm talking about. And there are institutional review boards who will say whether or not this is safe or not, whether it's appropriate or not. There is very strong resistance to using high doses of vitamin C, vitamin E, and beta carotene. We've talked about beta carotene. Let's talk about vitamin C. Vitamin C does not cause kidney stones. There is no evidence that it does. There's no evidence that it ever has caused it. A vitamin C kidney stone is like the Loch Ness Monster. Everybody knows what it is. Nobody has brought in evidence that it exists. Vitamin C kidney stone is like a unicorn. Everybody knows what a unicorn is, but they don't exist. Now, you can imagine in your mind's eye what a unicorn might look like. You could draw me a picture of a unicorn, but they don't exist. So vitamin C kidney stones are a very popular myth, a very popular legend. We talked about vitamin D, but just uh, vitamin E, rather, but just to review, the natural form of vitamin E is the form the body wants. It cannot use the left-handed form. It just can't. Beta carotene is not what harms smokers. It is, of course, the cigarettes and tobacco themselves. Moving on to osteoporosis, a major concern of the elderly, if we have elderly in our family, we know this is true, but most folks are unaware of just how severe this problem is. Just in the United States alone, there are over 300,000 hip fractures every year among persons over age 65, and the vast majority are caused by weakened bones. But here is an even more interesting piece of knowledge. Fractures and their complications are a major cause of death in the elderly. And somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% of elderly will actually die because of their hip fracture. This does not mean that the fracture kills them outright. It means it impairs their mobility. And this then can lead to difficulty in getting proper food. It can lead to isolation. It can lead to depression. There are so many things that are involved. So the number of deaths just in the United States every year is nearly 100,000. That's a very large number of fatalities. That's more than pneumonia. And pneumonia has long been called the old man's friend because it takes so many people that are old, they end their life with pneumonia. More people end their life because they fell. Now, maybe we can't stop them from falling, but at least we can make them stronger so when they do fall, they don't break anything. What can we do? Not a surprise, is it? Vitamin D. Sure. Osteoporosis and low vitamin D levels are related. And along with calcium supplementation, 800 units of vitamin D a day was shown in a double-blind study published in New England Journal of Medicine to increase bone density and reduce hip fractures by an astounding 43%. Please note again the modest intake of vitamin D. 800 units is not a lot. I'll bet if you're taking vitamin D, you're taking more than that. I know I am. I took vitamin D in larger than RDA doses for 20 years because I was the vitamin guy and I would take all my vitamins and finally I thought I should go and have my vitamin D level checked. So after 20 years of taking three times the RDA, far more than 800, closer to 1500, I went to the doctor, had the test, did not tell the doctor what I was doing, test came back and she wrote on there, uh, your vitamin D levels are low, you should supplement. 
I took her advice. I greatly increased my vitamin D, now up to around 2,500 to 3,000 units a day, four or five times this nearly, and I took that for two years. Went back, had my vitamin D level checked again, guess what? Still low. Now I don't mess around. Now I take five to 6,000 units a day, and I think things will be better next time I have it tested. This is 800 units, and look at the reduction, 43% from a modest increase. People who tell you that vitamin supplementation is expensive and a waste of money are not reading the journals, are they? To make it more personal, my mother was a grand mal epileptic. She took Dilantin for half a century. It worked, but it had a cost. One of the side effects of Dilantin, unfortunately, is it increases a person's need for vitamin D. And at that time, doctors had no knowledge of that. And at that time, I had no knowledge of it until she started breaking things. So I asked her to raise her vitamin D level. And it's always a pleasure when someone in your family takes your advice. It's sometimes a rare event when someone in your family takes your advice. But she did and started taking 2,500 units a day, and she never broke a bone again as long as she lived. Even though she still fell from time to time. Even though she still required inpatient care from time to time. But nothing broke. And that is my story here. And here's the backup. Epileptics, indeed, may need as much as 4,000 international units a day. And uh, I offer you this study, and note that date, 1974. In 1974, I was a senior in college. Boy, those were the days. Now I look in the mirror and say, who's that old man with all that gray hair? Vitamin D was first isolated from tuna fish oil in 1936. It was synthesized in 1952. It is not exactly a vitamin. It's a pro-hormone sterile, which the body actually can make. Normal definition of vitamin is it's a necessary substance your body cannot make. But with vitamin D, it can if it has the right conditions, and that is sunlight. Now, vitamin D as cholecalciferol is the form that we and other animals make when we have enough sunlight, and it is what is found in fish liver oil. Oddly enough, fish cannot make vitamin D. That makes you think, doesn't it? We can make vitamin D, but we don't get enough sun, so we eat fish oil, which has vitamin D, which fish can't make. Maybe they don't spend enough time in the sun. But they get their vitamin D by eating good, wholesome foods. The planktonic algae that they eat contain vitamin D. There are two commercial sources of vitamin D, natural vitamin D. One is fish liver oil. The other is an oil extracted from wool. And if your vitamin supplement product does not say it, um, you can bet that it's going to come from wool. But they don't like to put that on the label because it doesn't look quite as good, does it? If it says fish oil is the source, then it is. If it does not, it's probably coming from wool manufacture. Nothing wrong with that, but I just thought I'd throw that in because when I saw that, I thought, no kidding. You don't really think of sheep as making lots of vitamin D, but of course, and isn't there wool in the sun? I sincerely hope so. Animals get vitamin D by licking their fur. Humans, rickets can be successfully treated by rubbing cod liver oil on your skin. So if you have a patient who says, I don't want to take supplements, or a child who can't, it doesn't matter. Just rub cod liver oil on an infant's skin. They don't have to swallow anything. Less work for mom and dad. Isn't that astonishing? We tend to forget that the skin is our largest organ, and it's an absorptive surface. So there's a case where it can be used. I thought this was fascinating. Vitamin D may offer another benefit, according to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota and USA. Blue Cross and Blue Shield is a major health insurance company. When older individuals take vitamin D supplements, they have less of a tendency to sway while standing or walking, and may therefore be less likely to fall. 
Now, I have no idea how that might work, but I think it's interesting that not only do people who take vitamin D have fewer fractures, they're less likely to fall. A review of women with osteoporosis hospitalized for hip fractures showed that 50% had vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin K also helps to strengthen bone. We get vitamin K effortlessly or nearly effortlessly by adding green leafy vegetables to our diet. Yes, this will be vitamin K1. And many a supplement manufacturer will tell you that you need K2, and that is correct. But your body will make the conversion for you. Very important point. John Cannell, physician, has a very long quote here that I'd like to give you just a moment to uh, read, and I'll be right back. I promise. So here it is. It shows the actual references demonstrating that we knew first in rats and then in people that this conversion does in fact take place. In 2006, we had confirmation it takes place in people, not just in rats. And now we even know the mechanism. This is all fairly recent. Note the date on that last study in the journal Biological Chemistry, 2013. So the secret is to consume enough vitamin K by having large amounts of green leafy vegetables. My grandmother and my mother were always on our cases, my brother and myself, to get us to eat more green leafy vegetables, and I guess they were right. Dr. Cannell says that modern folks are deficient in K2 because they do not get enough K1 and that means they need to eat their greens. The Vitamin D Council is a very good place to go for more information uh, on vitamin D. Another one is called SUNARC, S-U-N-A-R-C. These are non-commercial organizations. Thank you. Thanks. Magnesium. When we think fractures, we often think calcium, but magnesium deficiency may be an explanation for the low correlation between osteoporosis and calcium. Magnesium regulates active calcium transport and magnesium supplementation has been shown to increase bone density. Once again, so many people hear calcium, calcium, calcium. In the United States, in my experience, calcium fortified breakfast cereal, calcium fortified orange juice, I'm sure there's calcium-fortified Skittles. It's just amazing, the emphasis on calcium. But almost never do you pick up a box of breakfast cereal that says, now with more magnesium. And oddly enough, if people ate the whole grains, they'd have the wheat germ, which has the magnesium. It's almost as if the food industry just doesn't get it. The RDA for magnesium is around 350 to 400 milligrams a day. When I say RDA, I'm referring to what is the most common United States dietary standard. It is the recommended dietary allowance. Most persons do not consume the RDA of magnesium. Estrogen therapy. The medical world seems to have blown hot and cold on this for quite a long time, but the fact of the matter is that estrogen administration doesn't work, and as a matter of fact, it actually causes a reduction in bone remodeling rates, which may actually increase the risk of fracture. And estrogen carries an increased risk for cancer, and I would say that the pharmaceutical industry has relatively little to gain from a cheap cure such as vitamin D or vitamin K. Boron, a trace mineral, helps strengthen bone. Interesting study some years ago that showed that rats, even rats with calcium deficient diets, had stronger vertebrae. And when these rats had died, they tried crushing the vertebrae and they found that if they had boron, 
their um, vertebrae were more crush resistant. The amount of boron we probably need to prevent osteoporosis is quite low. Uh, just a milligram or two would probably do it. Naturally grown, organically grown, mineral-rich food makes stronger bones and also speeds the healing of broken ones. You may remember the time of the Great Depression, and perhaps you have heard the stories of the Dust Bowl in the United States. This is when the middle part of the country suffered from severe drought, and along came the winds and blew the topsoil away. That was called the Dust Bowl. Did you ever wonder where all that soil landed? It landed in Hereford County, Texas, because in Deaf Smith, Texas, that's the real name of this place, in Deaf Smith, Texas, the topsoil is about 10 feet deep. And way back in 1954, in the Journal of Applied Nutrition, uh, L.B. Barnett commented on the amount of time it took to heal a fracture. In Dallas County, the average age for a broken hip was 63 years of age. In Deaf Smith County, it's 81 years of age. And the average healing time in Dallas, Texas, was six to nine months. In Deaf Smith, it was eight weeks. There was hope that fluoride would make bones stronger. It doesn't. Not only does fluoride fail to protect bones from fracture, it actually increases the risk of fracture. This is going to become a big problem in the next two generations, in my opinion, because now in the United States, among teenagers, 43% of all American teenagers have modeling of the teeth, which is dental fluorosis, a sign of overdose of fluoride. There are other comments here uh, that I will just suggest are backing this up. Uh, unfortunately, fluoride given as a treatment for osteoporosis doesn't work but fluoride put in drinking water may actually increase the risk of osteoporosis later on. Unfortunately, it's even worse than that. The U.S. National Toxicology Program in 1990 and the National Cancer Institute, both very conservative, medically, pharmaceutically conservative organizations, found a fluoride-related increase in osteosarcoma in young men. Isn't it interesting that if 43% of American teenagers have dental fluorosis that you can actually see, modeling, chalkiness, discoloration of the teeth, would it be surprising, perhaps, that there would be more osteosarcoma, unfortunately, in young men? Let's move to arthritis. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. William Kaufman. Kaufman, an MD as well as a PhD, back in 1939 successfully treated both rheumatoid and osteoarthritis with niacinamide. Niacinamide is vitamin B3. It's a form of niacin. The reason niacinamide is popular is primarily because it does not cause a flush. If you've ever taken niacin, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, if you were manufacturing supplements, would you put something in the supplement that made everybody turn red? Probably not. And if you were a health food store owner, you would not want the complaints either. So niacinamide is the form of vitamin B3, normally put into B-complex vitamins and multiples for that reason. Dr. Kaufman used niacinamide because he himself did not like the niacin flush. Personally, I enjoy the niacin flush, but then I live in Rochester, New York, just across the lake from Toronto, where it's cold all the time. It is very unusual for me to be in Philippines where the weather is this different than what I have to put up with year by year. I'm enjoying it. In 1949, Dr. Kaufman published a book, The Common Form of Joint Dysfunction, he received mail from around the world just addressed to the arthritis doctor, Connecticut. Now, Connecticut's not a town. Connecticut's a state. That shows the amount of uh, fame that Dr. Kaufman had achieved. Here's his protocol, what you came in for. He gave 250 milligrams of niacinamide 
every one and a half hours for a daily dose of 10 doses totaling about 2,500 milligrams. Now this would vary, some people took more, some less, some had not as frequent dosage, but basically he gave niacinamide in divided doses with the B-complex vitamins and any water-soluble vitamin, dividing the dose does get you better results. Because if you take a lot of niacinamide at once, say at breakfast, by lunch, most of it will be gone. So it's more efficient to divide the dose. Now, Dr. Kaufman found that his patients had improved grip strength and improved joint mobility. He went on to treat close to 1,000 patients with niacinamide, and he also used the B vitamins thiamine, riboflavin, pyridoxine, and panathenic acid. And he gave large doses of vitamin C. Wonderful radio interview back in 1978, Dr. Kaufman talks about a patient who was so arthritic, the doctor could not bend his arm to measure his blood pressure. He was one of my first patients, he says. I gave him niacinamide for one week, and then I gave him a look-alike placebo, and although he'd improved on the placebo, in a week he was back with his joint stiff again. So this showed Dr. Kaufman that this was a good therapy. And he emphasized dividing the dose all through the waking day. Some people say, well, that's inconvenient. It is. But the people I've talked to have said that arthritis is more inconvenient. Severely crippled arthritic patients may need as much as 4,000 milligrams of niacinamide a day. And when they took that in one to three months, patients were now getting out of their chair or out of their bed. They were able to comb their hair and walk upstairs, Dr. Kaufman said. They were no longer prisoners of the house. There's the good doctor, and I would like to mention that his entire book for the common form of joint dysfunction is now posted on the internet, thanks to the kindness of Mrs. Kaufman, Charlotte Kaufman, his widow. She allowed me to do that, and at my website, doctoryourself.com, you, well, you can look at every single chapter and, of course, print them out if you want. There's also an article, uh, two articles, reviewing his work at DrYourself.com, and you might want to take a look at those. There are more references and more insights by Dr. Kaufman. His book was privately printed back in 1949, and there were only probably 1,000 copies at most. That's why it's particularly good for us to have this online. A medical doctor named Francis Pottinger did interesting nutritional experiments on cats over a period of 10 years. Cats that were fed a typical cooked food diet developed many degenerative diseases, including arthritis. Dr. Pottinger found you could reverse the condition by feeding the animals only fresh raw foods. Now that's exactly what they were doing at the sanatoriums in the 1800s. That's exactly what Bernard McFadden was doing. That's exactly what James Caleb Jackson is doing. And now we have yet another scientist, in this case a qualified observer to be sure, who spent 10 years seeing with his own eyes that animals fed raw foods were getting better. Large doses of vitamin C have been shown to reduce all forms of inflammation throughout the body. It's well known that vitamin C is essential for co forming collagen. Without enough vitamin C, collagen cannot properly be made. And this is not new. Here's a mention from the New York State Journal of Medicine way back in 1965, showing abnormalities in this protein collagen are basic to the crippling deformities associated with rheumatic diseases. In 1965, in 1975, in 1985, the American of uh, organizations that did arthritis research all said, without exception, diet had nothing to do with arthritis. I was there, I saw it with my own eyes. Vi diet had nothing to do with arthritis, and yet it does. The public has not always been told the full story. The key, of course, is to use enough vitamin C. Studies showing little vitamin C benefit generally employ low doses. 
Thousands of milligrams are required for clinical improvement. Here's an example. In 1950, 4,000 milligrams a day was shown to be effective as an anti-rheumatic agent. Note the journal, New England Journal of Medicine, generally regarded as a good journal. 1952, now in Germany, they found that 6,000 milligrams of vitamin C was effective. By 1953, Greer had used 8 to 12,000 milligrams of vitamin C, and we may need even more than that. But look at the dates, once again. Look at the dates. We've known this for this long. And for all those decades, millions of people were not told to take more vitamin C. Indeed, how many of you have heard people told not to take vitamin C? Because it's a waste of money. It will give you expensive urine. Well, you know what gives you expensive urine? Drugs. They give you really expensive urine. I have a friend who was on a cancer therapy. He was paying $1,000 a pill. Now, that's expensive urine. I'm happy to tell you he's done very well. The drugs seem to help him, but I also must admit that he took massive doses of vitamin C as well. Which helped him more? I don't care. He's doing fine. Vitamin B6, pyridoxine. John Ellis, an MD in Texas, employed pyridoxine because it shrinks the synovial membranes of weight-bearing joints, reduces pain, and improves mobility, all good, in elbows, shoulders, knees, and wrists. Ellis wrote a book called Free of Pain back in 1983. Now, very large doses of B6 may cause some temporary neurological side effects. And this has caused a lot of writers and a lot of physicians to walk away from pyridoxine, but we need to put a perspective here. A thousand milligrams a day of vitamin B6 is more than you need. Modest doses, 75 to 300 milligrams a day, are very safe. And this is coming from Alan Gaby, who is a very reliable physician and wrote uh, the best textbook on nutritional medicine, which is simply called Nutritional Medicine. It's a huge book. The safety of one B vitamin is magnified by giving it with the rest of the B complex. So people who take just B6 in very large amounts are more likely to have side effects. People who take modest amounts of B6 are unlikely to have side effects, particularly when they take it with the other B vitamins. Once more, the health nut angle, there have been writers outside the medical profession that have emphasized having raw food diets, sprouted seeds, and sprouted grains. Two of them are Ann Wigmore and Victoris Kolvenskis. Prostate health. One of the tocotrienols, one of the vitamin E factors, actually kills prostate cancer stem cells. There's another one that didn't get it into the news magazines and the media and television and most of the internet. Now note this study, International Journal of Cancer 2011. Mice given gamma tocotrienol orally had a 75% decrease in tumor formation. If a drug got that result, it would be front page news, and rightfully so. Now this is only one of the factors in vitamin E, but you've got to use natural vitamin E or you don't get this factor. They use synthetic vitamin E and they say it doesn't work, and that's because it doesn't. Natural vitamin E does. Gamma tocotrienol is even effective against existing prostate tumors. And we have two references here, Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences and the European Journal of Lipid Sciences, both relatively recent. Repeating what we said earlier for emphasis. I looked at a paper that said that vitamin E causes cancer, increases cancer. And I got out my little find function on the PDF, and I plunked in the word tocotrinol. It was a big paper. 
just to see how many times the author mentioned tocotrinols, since gamma tocotrinol actually kills prostate cancer stem cells, wouldn't he have mentioned it? No, he did not. The word tocotrinol does not even appear in the paper. Now, I have taught undergraduates and graduates and postdocs, and none of them would ever dream of publishing a paper or trying to and not at least giving some kind of background to set the stage for their research. 300 units of natural vitamin E reduces lung cancer by 61%. And this is again from the International Journal of Cancer back in 2008. So synthetic vitamin E doesn't work, natural vitamin E does. You hear this from other people, but I think it's important to back this up with the references that have actually shown it. A lot here, but I'll just give you the highlights. Vitamin E reduces mortality in general by 24% in persons 71 years of age or older. Vitamin E is an effective treatment for atherosclerosis. 400 to 800 units of vitamin E reduces risk of heart attack by 77%. Increasing vitamin E with supplements prevents chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, and such. 800 units of vitamin E is a successful treatment for fatty liver. And vitamin E supplements even help to prevent ALS. Most of these references are fairly new. All of these diseases are very important, and yet vitamin E, as I mentioned earlier, has largely been marginalized. Over the years, critics of vitamin E called it a cure in search of a disease. They claimed it didn't do anything, but it does. Glaucoma. Certainly a concern in the elderly. There have actually been many papers. Remember that I said that because I'm going to make a small presenter's joke in a minute. There have been many papers showing that you reduce the intraocular pressure by taking high doses of vitamin C. An example here from Alternative Medical Medicine Review shows that vitamin C in high doses uh, works because of its osmotic effect to reduce pressure. There are about 15 megavitamin C and glaucoma papers discussed in the book written by Erwin Stone, The Healing Factor. Now that came out in the 70s. Erwin Stone was actually the man who put Linus Pauling onto vitamin C in the first place. So even back by 1975, there were 15 papers that showed vitamin C reduced pressure inside the eye. And that's, that's the joke. So if a doctor says, I've never seen any evidence that vitamin C is good for whatever, that doctor's probably telling the truth. The doctor probably hasn't seen it. Doesn't mean it isn't there. In 1972, I had never seen Australia. In 1973, I studied there for a year. Well, that changed everything. I saw my first kangaroo. <laughs> it was weird. We were coming home from somewhere late at night, driving along, and all of a sudden, this kangaroo is bouncing up in front of the headlights. Now, I know this is going to sound silly, and you're going to think that this Yankee's been watching too many cartoons when he was a boy. But I was surprised that it wasn't going boing, boing, boing. It was completely silent. So when you see your first kangaroo, you realize something, and this is true with vitamin therapy. You have to see it to believe it. And without stretching the point, people with glaucoma will see it a lot better if doctors prescribe the vitamin C for them. Here's a problem that's getting worse. Adult onset diabetes in the United States now, literally two out of three adults are obese. One out of three children are obese. The problem is getting out of hand. So we're even seeing type 2 diabetes in kids. Abram Hoffer, my personal mentor, 
wrote that there are many positive factors for treating type 2 diabetes, and here are some magnesium, exercise, weight control, chromium, B vitamins, vitamin E, vanadium, vitamin C, and complex carbohydrates. And he personally used those in his practice and found the results were good. A colleague of mine, a niacin researcher, Todd Pemberty, said that if you go to PubMed and search for thiamine deficiency, thiamine is vitamin B1, and diabetes, you will get dozens of references that describe how many symptoms of diabetes are actually caused by thiamine deficiency. Now, thiamine is a very cheap vitamin, and you can get thiamine and riboflavin and niacin and panathenic acid and the others in a B-complex supplement for just a very small cost. Pemberty says that deficiencies of B vitamins and other essential nutrients are important in diabetes. Currently, in conventional management, supplementation-based nutrition therapy is utterly neglected. I would agree with that statement. Now, vitamin C helps prevent type 2 diabetes in those that consume processed meats, uh, cold cuts, deli meats, hot dogs, using the preservative and color enhancer sodium nitrite. Now, nitrite will be converted in the stomach into nitrosamine compounds, which can cause insulin resistance and even cancer. This creation is promoted by cooking these foods at frying temperatures. A randomized study reported that those with higher intakes of nitrite had a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes, but only in those subjects with low vitamin C intake. A higher intake of vitamin C was associated with decreased risk of type 2 diabetes even in those with high intake of nitrate. So it's actually not the nitrates, it's scurvy. And when's the last time a physician, a colleague, a friend, a reporter, when's the last time someone said, you know, for Adult onset diabetes, you should try more vitamin C. And now we see a reason. And that's a, a 2017 uh, study that Dr. Robert G. Smith of the University of Pennsylvania Medical School is quoting. A lot of blindness, a great many amputations, and way too many deaths result from the circulatory complications of diabetes. People don't measure this cost until it's too late. I have personally seen diabetics get their medication reduced when they take a high-potency balanced B-complex tablet every two to three hours during the day. So if someone is on medication for type 2 diabetes, or for that matter, if they're on insulin, if you prescribe for them high doses of B vitamins in divided doses, you will expect that their need for medication will go down. So you must be sure the patient has monitoring so we know what to do. You can't just take a patient on all these medications and now introduce the vitamins and leave it at that. You have to crisscross. You've got to decrease the medication while increasing the vitamins, and this requires physician monitoring. I have found that most physicians are willing to do that. I tell patients, you don't have to have a physician that is a naturopath, although it's good if you do. You don't have to have a physician that's an orthomolecular specialist or has extensive nutritional training, although it would be good if you did. I tell them, you don't need a physician that agrees with you on everything. You need a workable doctor. You need a, you need a doctor that is intellectually curious and treats you as an adult. And if you want a therapeutic trial of nutrition, I think there's much to be said for it and very little to be said against it. So again, diabetics should demand a suitably cautious therapeutic trial with dosage adjustments made and supervised by their doctor. Large doses of niacin or niacinamide may improve carbohydrate tolerance in diabetics. Niacin or niacinamide actually diminish the requirements of insulin needed to keep the blood sugar of the diabetics within normal limits. Look at the date of this study. It's quoted in the third edition 
of the nutrition textbook Vitamins and Medicine from 1953. We've known about this for a long time, but remember, this is a historical perspective, and we're finding out that we are not the first generation that was hip to nutrition. Long before us, doctors were looking at it, but they were ignored. Perhaps you've experienced the same kind of thing even now. Persons with vitamin B3 deficiency may show hypersensitivity to insulin, becoming hypoglycemic more readily than normal subjects after an injection of insulin. All of this points to nutritional deficiency. And of course, excess sugar consumption is a huge problem and it's just getting worse. May I introduce you to Thomas Lattimore Cleave of the British Royal Navy. He was a captain. That's equivalent to a uh, full colonel and a surgeon. Cleave wrote a book called The Saccharine Disease, not to be confused with saccharin, but saccharine, referring to things that are sweet, and published that in 1975, showing that excess sugar consumption is a key cause of adult onset diabetes and some more diseases. In the 1920s, the former chief of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration actually stated in writing that sugar consumption could cause diabetes in the 1920s. I don't think the FDA thinks that anymore, but they did then. Alzheimer's. What could more clearly exhibit one of the problems we have with aging than the increase in Alzheimer's disease? More than half of all nursing home beds now are occupied by Alzheimer's patients. The cost in money is astronomical. The cost in pain and suffering is far beyond that. Alzheimer's is now the fourth largest cause of death in the US, killing over 100,000 persons each year. Dr. Abram Hoffer commented that if people took supplements before they were 50, they'd be less likely to have Alzheimer's after that. He had several papers on this, and his colleague, Dr. Harold Foster, wrote an interesting book, which is hard to find, but you can get it on the internet, called What Really Causes Alzheimer's Disease? Clinically, the symptoms of B12 deficiency and Alzheimer's disease are almost identical. I think if I handed you 10 patients with symptoms of Alzheimer's, and I had five of them with B12 deficiency, that you could not tell which was which. B12 deficiency is easy to come by in the elderly. Poor diet, poor intestinal absorption due to less intrinsic factor being produced by the stomach as we get older, Poor absorption due to digestive tract surgery. Again, the longer people live, the more likely they are to need it. Pharmaceutical interference. The average uh, elderly person is taking three to 15 drugs a day, depending what estimate you look at. It's probably somewhere in the middle. And stress. All decrease B12 availability in the elderly. Even marginal B12 deficiency over a long time period produces an increased risk in Alzheimer's disease. Nearly three quarters of the elderly deficient in B12 also have Alzheimer's disease. There's a flag. But the bottom line is, let's test it. If you give injections or intranasal administration of B12, both of these are better than oral administration, particularly in the elderly. Methylcobalamin may work a little bit better than cyanocobalamin, but both work. And as cyanocobalamin is so inexpensive, I really should sit this so it doesn't tilt, shouldn't I? Because B12 is so inexpensive as cyanocobalamin, uh, there is no need for people to spend a lot of money to get good results. A minimum daily dose for therapeutic purposes is at least 100 micrograms. And I think 1,000 micrograms daily would be more effective. The elderly are actually dieting without knowing it. B12 
The older we get, the worse our sense of smell. Our sense of taste is related to our sense of smell. And when you add in emotional factors such as isolation, grief, and depression, major problems in the elderly, we're going to have inadequate food intake and therefore lower B12 intake. And B12 deficiency itself causes a loss of appetite. So it just spirals out of control. Look at the symptoms of B12 deficiency. Thank you. The symptoms of B12 deficiency are all too reminiscent of diseases such as Alzheimer's. Here they are, ataxia, fatigue, slowness of thought, apathy, emaciation, degeneration of the spinal cord, dizziness, moodiness, confusion, agitation, delusions, hallucinations, and psychosis. Now there's Alzheimer's in there someplace, in my opinion. So the first thing to do with an Alzheimer's patient is to give him an IM shot of 1,000 milligrams of B12, and then think about other things you can do. It was Dr. Roger J. Williams, himself a discoverer of one of the B vitamins, panathenic acid, who said, when in doubt, use nutrition first. In modern medicine, nutrition is often used last. Other nutrients that have a role in Alzheimer's include folic acid, vitamin C, and niacin. Antioxidant vitamins may slow or prevent Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's patients have low measurable levels of these nutrients, maybe because they don't eat enough of them, or maybe because the disease increases need for them, or both. Here's the proof. Nice study here with a second one that you can look at as well. Alzheimer's patients who take 2,000 units of vitamin E per day live longer. Now, the USRDA for vitamin E is uh, 22 and a half units. So we're talking orders of magnitude more of nutrients than the RDA. Once again, when you try to do that research, the institutional review boards or colleagues or administration or politicians are going to say, oh no, that's too much. So they use low-dose studies that don't work. And then they do more low-dose studies, which also don't work. Well, we have to do high-dose studies, which do work. But they won't because they've arbitrarily said, that vitamin will kill you, or at the very least, give you expensive urine. Look at this. People of retirement age who took supplements of both vitamin E and vitamin C saw their risk of Alzheimer's disease drop by nearly 80%. That's 8-0. If that were a pharmaceutical, it would be on the cover of Time magazine. Also useful for Alzheimer's is choline related to the B vitamins. Alzheimer's patients have a deficiency of acetylcholine because they are deficient in the enzyme that makes it. So increasing dietary choline raises brain levels of acetylcholine. We know this is true. One of the studies was done at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Choline is cheap and non-prescription. So here we have a study back from 1985 showing that supplemental choline seems to help. The key here is you have to take a lot. The most common source of choline for most customers, for most consumers, is lecithin. And because lecithin tastes rather crummy, most people don't like the thickness or the granulars, uh, granular form, so they take it in capsules. And when people buy lecithin supplements, the capsules are quite large. They're regular horse capsules. And they think, oh, that's a lot. But they actually need tablespoons of lecithin, and it takes 8 to 12 capsules to make a tablespoon. Very few people are going to take 30 capsules a day of lecithin, and who would want to? So I emphasize that the dose of choline has to be high if you want it to work. It's all about dose. One of my favorite studies. They took mice, and they gave them the mouse equivalent of Alzheimer's. Then they gave them the human body weight equivalent of two to 3,000 milligrams of niacinamide, and the researchers said cognitively they were cured. They performed as if they'd never developed the disease. Isn't that amazing? 
And this is exactly the dose that William Kaufman used to treat arthritis. And now we think, wait a minute, how do I explain that? Niacin is good for Alzheimer's, niacin is good for arthritis. How do I reconcile that? You reconcile it in this way. You can buy a lot of things with money. A broad spectrum antibiotic is considered valuable because it has many uses. Well, if a drug can have many uses, surely a vitamin can have many uses. And there are only three dozen nutrients, so with thousands of reactions in the body, somebody must be doing more than one thing. And the study authors paid a whopping 30 US dollars a year for the niacin they, that they bought for this study. Isn't that wonderful? Talk about economy. My mentor said, patients ask me, how dangerous is niacin therapy? And he would say, you're going to live a lot longer. Is that a problem for you? Aluminum may cause Alzheimer's. There's a lot of debate on this. But one thing we know for sure, aluminum does build up in body tissues of persons with Alzheimer's. It just does. So probably it would be a good idea to make sure they reduce their aluminum intake. Aluminum cookware, aluminum foil, and acids, all kinds of things contain aluminum. If you want to see how much aluminum can go to food during processing, take an aluminum pot to cook in in the kitchen. Whoop, and if you put stewed tomatoes in that pot, and if you boil those tomatoes, and then pour the tomatoes out, you will see the pitting in the aluminum, you'll actually see where the acidity from the tomatoes has eaten away the aluminum pot and dissolved it into the food. So I think the precautionary principle says we should avoid aluminum cookware and aluminum overconsumption in general. Aluminum is in so-called amalgam dental fillings or um, mercury fillings. White fillings, composite fillings, do not contain aluminum. Dialysis can cause what's known as dialysis dementia. And look at what does. It's the excess aluminum. So we know from dialysis patients getting dementia that they are experiencing this almost certainly because they have too much aluminum, and we can prove it. We can see the cause and effect. Animals injected with aluminum compounds also develop nervous system disorders. Vitamin C may be a good way to help remove excess aluminum from the body. To some extent, vitamin C can act as a chelating agent. If you go to PubMed, easily accessible for free on the internet, and you type in aluminum and Alzheimer's, you will find a lot of studies. Same with lead toxicity. One of the problems we have with lead is that it's persistent. And for many years, lead was in gasoline, and industry gave off a lot of lead. And we know that's a factor as well. People who have bed sores, when they have more vitamin C, they have rapid healing, a concern of the elderly. More vitamin C is necessary than the RDA. I was taking my vitamins one evening, and Dr. Hoffer looked over and said, you know, if you take all those vitamins, you're going to live a lot longer. And then he added, if you don't, come back and see me. Dr. Hoffer died at the age of 91. I miss him. Mark Twain tells of an elderly lady who was dying. The doctor went to see her. The doctor said, you've got to stop smoking, drinking, and cussing. The lady, lady said, I've never done any of those. The doctor said, well, that's your problem. You've neglected your habits. She was like a sinking ship, said Twain, without any freight to throw overboard. Perhaps it's a good idea for us to recognize that when Linus Pauling was vilified for advocating vitamins, it does not mean he was wrong. He lived to be 93 years of age. Roger Williams, discoverer of panathenic acid, was 94. He's the one who said, when in doubt, try nutrition first. William Kaufman, who used niacinamide for arthritis, died at the age of 89. Our own Dr. Thomas Levy has said the highest plasma levels of vitamin C are associated with the least mortality from heart disease as well as from cancer and other causes. And we very much hope that Dr. Levy will live a very long life. 
As Woody Allen put it, I don't want to become immortal through my work. I want to become immortal by not dying. I had a good friend in Vermont. I called her up on her 99th birthday. She was not home. Longfellow put it beautifully, joy, temperance, and repose slam the door in the doctor's nose. When we look at very old people, we find they have one thing in common. They all have something they absolutely positively have to do tomorrow. This can-do attitude is very valuable, very healthy. Back in Baroque France, the king asked Moliere, what use do you make of your physician? Moliere answered, we chat, sire. He gives me his prescriptions. I never follow them, and so I get well. <laughs> this is the Orthomocular Medicine News Service. Subscriptions are free. It is peer-reviewed and non-commercial. And this is just a silly joke. An elephant woke up with a stuffy nose, was convinced his days were numbered, because in an elephant, a stuffy nose is quite severe, made his funeral arrangements, gave his possessions away, then went to the doctor. The doctor said, relax, you'll be fine in a few days. And that just goes to show that because your trunk is packed doesn't mean you're ready to go. I want to thank you very much for your attention. It's been a real pleasure being with you this morning.